global markets have regained some ground overnight, with the Nikkei back up 10.2%. US stocks are up around 2%. Meanwhile, the RBA held hawkishly through the turmoil. New Zealand unemployment is set to jump and Japanese wages are on the rise. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, surveys the hawkish tones and forecasts in the RBA's monetary policy statement yesterday. There were two options on the table. It was a hike or no change. And in the RBA's mind, a cut in Australia remains a very long way away. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, markets bounced overnight, regaining some of the losses experienced in previous days, as US recession fears were tempered. At 4am Sydney Melbourne time, the S&P 500 was up 2%, while the Nikkei yesterday rose 10%. U.S. Treasury yields were up about 11 basis points as pricing for the Fed funds rate eased back to 107 basis points of cuts this year from 116 yesterday. Throughout all this, the Reserve Bank of Australia held its cash rate at 4.35%. ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, says the RBA's language and forecasts were, if anything, more hawkish than in May, meaning ANZ Research is sticking with its call that the RBA will first cut rates in February next year. The fact that when we get Q3 inflation ahead of the RBA's November board meeting, the impact of cost of living measures on that CPI, I think will make interpretation of that a little bit tricky. So it's hard to see the circumstances of events that would sort of get the RBA easing this year, absent some extraordinary global shock. And obviously markets have been volatile over the past few days, but globally the economic environment, while softening, doesn't seem quite that week. So no, we will stick with February, but also only a modest easing cycle once the easing cycle does kick off. On those hawkish tones from the RBA, the Aussie dollar was up 0.6% at 65.35 US cents as of 4am Sydney Melbourne time. The Kiwi was up 0.3% at 59.57 US cents. We'll have more from Adam on that RBA decision in today's deep dive. Number two, Amid those hawkish tones from the RBA, there was one slightly dovish forecast change, with the peak unemployment rate rising to 4.4% from 4.3%. ANZ Senior Economist Catherine Birch says Australian jobs data out yesterday suggests the labour market will continue to ease, with the ANZ ND job ad series falling 3% in July, to be down 16.7%. From January. It's still sitting over 13% above its pre pandemic level. So there is still quite a bit of unfilled labour demand out there. But if we do see that come off or continue to come off and and get quite a bit lower, then there is a risk that the labour market could slow more sharply than, than we in the RBA are forecasting. But our central scenario at the moment is that unemployment only rises just a little bit more. And the ANZ Roy Morgan Consumer Confidence Survey also weakened again slightly last week, coming off that six-month high from a fortnight ago. Number three, New Zealand's June quarter jobs data today will indicate how much spare capacity is in the economy. ANZ New Zealand Chief Economist Sharon Zollner is forecasting unemployment to rise from 4.3% to 4.7%. That's a touch higher than the Reserve Bank's 4.6% forecast, and employment is forecast to fall 0.2% versus the Reserve Bank's forecast for a 0.1% rise we would characterise our forecasts as meaningfully weaker than the Reserve Bank's. So, of course, the market is going to be looking for this data to tell them whether the Reserve Bank is going to be cutting rates next week or not. Anything with a five handle, well, the market's already pricing <laughs> very, very high odds of a cut anyway. They're not waiting for the data. But anything with a five handle, I think that would lock it in from the market's point of view. Number four, there was some welcome support for the Bank of Japan's hiking stance yesterday. And that all that volatility that many attributed to Bank Bank of Japan hawkishness. Real wages rose 1.1% annually in June, the first rise in 27 months. ANZ head of FX research Marja Bin Zaman says the market expectation had been for a 0.9% fall, with the rise playing into the BOJ's hands. This data is welcome news for the Bank of Japan after it raised interest rates and kind of unveiled a plan for quantitative tightening last week. The governor did note when he raised rates last week that inflation has been on track 
back, uh, driven by positive factors, including higher wages, feeding into services prices. So it looks like it's all playing out pretty well. Number five, Thailand releases inflation data for the month of July today, with ANZ Research expecting the headline rate to stay at 0.6%. Yesterday, the Philippines' annual July CPI inflation rate printed at 4.4% for the year, above the consensus forecast for 4.1%. That puts pressure on the central bank's ability to cut rates this month. Taiwan's annual CPI inflation rate printed at 2.52% in July versus market expectations for 2.6%. Here's ANZ economist Bunzi Madhavani. Taiwan is one of the regions in Asia where we do not expect the central bank to cut rates anytime soon. Earlier in the year, the CBC's major concern was getting inflation under control and managing inflation expectations. In that sense, this CPI report affirms to the CBC that inflation is under control and we expect them to keep policy rate unchanged when the next in September. Bunzi Marivani there. Now, in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, talks to my colleague Alex Tarrant in depth about the RBA's monetary policy statement, including a couple of hawkish surprises. I think there are a couple of things to take away from the statement. The first is the RBA is not at all phased by market volatility over the past uh, few days. So that would be takeout number one. Takeout number two is that, and this came out in the press conference, is that there were two options on the table. It was a hike or no change and that in the RBA's mind a cut in Australia remains a very long way away and I guess take out number three is that the Reserve Bank in their forecasts are expecting a slightly slower return of inflation to near the midpoint of the target band. In part that reflects both a stronger outlook for demand but also a potential reassessment on their part about the economy's ability to supply so that demand supply balance looking a little more under favourable as far as inflation is concerned than the RBA was thinking, say, three months ago. So look all up a very hawkish set of communication from the RBA, and certainly given where market pricing had gotten to, much, much more hawkish than where market expectations were heading into the meeting. You also say in your note, more hawkish than the previous statement. Are there particular words or phrases in there that led you to think that? There's a couple of things. I guess in the forecasts, there are three changes that are noteworthy, two of them you'd say uh, a hawkish and and one of them might be dovish. So net, you'd say the forecast changes are hawkish. So the hawkish changes are stronger GDP growth over much of the horizon, particularly a fairly large revision for GDP growth through to mid-2025. The second is a slightly higher trimmed mean inflation in the forecast. And the offsetting sort of dovish element there is that they've nudged the peak unemployment rate estimate from 4.3 to 4.4. But those forecasts changes in net took you in a slightly more hawkish direction. And then a couple of things in the accompanying communication, both the statement and the post-meeting statement, I should say, and then the statement on monetary policy. In the post-meeting statement, there was an addition of this line, quote, policy will need to be sufficiently restrictive until the board is confident that inflation is moving sustainably toward the target range, end quote. So I guess what the bank's doing there is saying, hold on, there's not going to be a near-term rate cut in Australia, or at least not on the bank's current thing. And then the third element was just that discussion in the post-meeting statement about the balance between demand and supply being a little less favourable as far as the inflation outlook itself is concerned. The other thing that I think is noteworthy, and it's a forecast we don't talk much about, the RBA's expectations for public final demand. So for people that did economics in the past, you might remember C plus I plus G. So the the RBA's expectations for for G, that public final demand have gone from growth of 2.1% over over the year to June 2025 to 4.1% over the year to June 2025. So I think probably a little bit more focus on public demand and what that might be doing to overall demand in this statement on monetary policy versus what we've seen in the past as well. Adam Boyton there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Wednesday, August the 7th. Catch you tomorrow with reaction to New Zealand's June quarter jobs figures. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.